Okay. So as I as I mentioned in the in the lightning round, so uh, and as Martin was also saying, that the the lack synchronization is just one aspect okay, of, of this uh, approach towards towards uh, approximate computing. Let me give a, a brief uh, overview of the concept. Okay, and that is the emerging important applications are different from what originally we, we tried to do computing for. Okay, and the important applications are things like search, where you need imprecise answer to imprecise queries. Okay. The proactive delivery of information, you need to mail out flyers and advertisements and offers and things of that sort, alerts, advices, or routes through uh, traffic and things of that sort. M media, that is we've got rendition of audio, video, and images. There is a certain am amount of approximation that can be uh, tolerated over there. Stream processing, okay, uh, invariably it's very fast decisions that, that have to be made on data which, is, which are possibly incomplete, okay. And all these benefit in cost performance by the use of some sort of prediction techniques. Okay, and prediction by its nature has, uh, relies on historical things which are, which are approximate in, in, in any way. So, so they allow the training off of accuracy of the results for the speed of delivering results. Okay, and, and I think we are in a realm where this is going to be more and more the case and we're going to see many more applications okay, and many more big computers okay, being built okay, in order to take care of these, these aspects. So the current techniques are very precise, okay, and, and the precision in, uh, 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 translates to energy inefficient. Okay, you find that there's a lot of lot of things uh, uh, which are uh, uh, devoted, okay, in order to make sure that things are precise. And and so what you have is a precise computation done on precise hardware. Precise hardware is expensive hardware, and to produce results that need not be precise. Okay, so many of the results that we get, okay. Are, are not precise in, in, uh, if, you, if you look at it uh, from the bigger picture. And what happens is that, that as, as we progress, the, there is going to be more unreliability and variability of devices, okay? And, and in the new generations of technology, and so what will happen is that that precise hardware, for example, will get even more expensive, okay, if you want to, if you want to uh, take advantage of that. So the approximate computing is to allow, have computational models that allow computational results to fall in some acceptable range. Okay, so that's what, that's what you're really talking about. And this, this notion of acceptable is very fuzzy and I'll get to that okay, as we go along. Okay. And what you want is also hardware that produces results that, that fall in some acceptable range. Okay. And, and so, so the dimensions of approximate computing okay, are, are three. Okay, you've got the computation aspects, okay, you've got the data aspects and the hardware aspects. So computation, you've got precise, okay, and you've got less precise, okay, and, and uh, memory models and things of that sort fall in this that category, okay. Uh, the the data, we are we always, I mean, many of our pro programs assume that the data that's incoming is very accurate. We we cannot we we are not dealing with imprecisions in the data itself, okay, and that so you can use less up to date data, less accurate data, possibly corrupted data, and and we need to tackle tackle uh, data of that kind. Hardware. We are assuming it's completely reliable, okay, whereas on, the, on this end, okay, it can be, it can be variable. So, so, so what, what you have is the human brain over there, working with less precise computation, okay, less accurate data, okay, and, and, and variable hardware, okay, at that, that end. And we are, we are over here, the computing model. And what we should aim for is in order to get efficient, power efficient, energy efficient, and time efficient computation, Okay, you need to focus on some model which is along that diagonal. Okay, now today, today I'll just address this part. Okay, that's somewhere along this axis how, how you can get towards that. Okay, and, and, and with, with just relaxed synchronization. And, and of course, there are the other axes which have to be. Yeah. When you say along the diagonal, do you mean somewhere in the middle of the space or do you mean along the diagonal? Along the diagonal. Some, no, somewhere in the middle of the space. Yeah, I, don't, I didn't really mean that. that, that. Uh, yes, you're right. Uh, okay, so so uh, uh, so what are the challenges and opportunities of relaxing synchronization? And Martin gave a good, good uh, idea of what, what that was already. Okay, let me just reiterate that. Uh, the principal uses of uh, synchronization are uh, that there are three things that you generally uh, work with, and uh, and that is one is to ensure that all the threads see consistent values of a shared variable. Okay, and, and you do that with atomic updates using locks. Uh, the second one is ensuring that threads reach some way, uh, some some point uh, in, in in a predictable manner. So you've got barriers and things of that sort. 
And the third is parallel update of data structures like linked list. Now, it's, it's interesting that, that I said this is difficult to relax, and, and the argument was that if you argue enough, okay, that this, this might actually be possible, okay, but if you did not argue properly and did not do the right thing, then it can lead to a fatal crash. Whereas these two are generally, with very little effort, you can find, you find that, that, that you can, you, 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 you are, they are very good candidates for relaxing synthesization. Okay, and so, so I'll, I'll not focus on this part. We we'll hope that the techniques that, that Martin and others uh, use, okay, will we'll address this part so there's more, more scope, okay, of, of, uh, uh, of relaxing synchronization. I'll show you how already you can get a, a large benefit about, from relaxing just that part. So the key question about relaxing synchronization is will the program produce results that are acceptable? And if acceptable, would the results be produced in considerably less time? So essentially, essentially the question is, is uh, resources. Okay, you want to do it with, with minimum resources. Uh, so I'll, I'll focus really on only on two. There are many others which are given in the, in the paper. I'll focus on k-means clustering and, and graph five, the breadth-first search in graph five. Uh, so the k-means clustering, the problem is to partition data into k clusters. Okay, and so you, you randomly select k initial means. Okay, so you want k clusters, you've got points, and, and you just randomly select these means. Okay, and then you create the k clusters by associating each point with each of those means. Okay, with the nearest uh, centroid that you've got over here. And then you recompute the centroid after you've done that. Iteratively do that until, until it converges. Okay, so that's, that, that's the standard technique that's used for, for k-means. Okay, and, and it, this, this technique is widely used. Okay, there are that are you used in market segmentation, data mining, computer vision, astronomy, many other, many other areas. You, you find in, in CAD, in computer data design, and other, other areas. Okay, so what is the overhead of synchronization in this problem? Okay, so you used to be used to power seven machine, uh, K-means cl uh, eight clusters with a very large input set, and it's an open MP based parallel code that was used. Okay, what you notice over here is this is the synchronization test. And this is the computation. Okay. So, 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 what you find is 90% of the time is used in synchronization. Okay, in, in these problems. Okay, so, and 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 so, so the question is, are we getting the bang for the buck? Okay, for having spent all this time, okay, in, in, in synchronization. Okay. So, what happens when you relax synchronization? So the, 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 the thing to observe is that, that there is a parallel evaluation of all points moving between clusters. And the synchronization, where synchronization is used, uh, is used it's used in, in updating the list of points that are moving. Okay? And uh, you look at the, and, and what, what, what more, what's more, you've got a stopping criterion which says while delta greater than some threshold. Okay, so what you find is, you, that uh, he already there is an approximation because people say I don't want to go to the bitter end. Okay, I just want to stop when when these uh, when uh, only a part of these things. Uh, I mean, when when sm some small part of these things have, uh, are, are remaining to be moved. Okay, so the number of points moving is uh, restricted, for example, to point point one percent of the total points. Okay, and then there is a a, a, a loop plus plus less than five hundred, which says subject to a max. Uh, to 500 iteration. So already the problem has an approximation built into it. Okay, now what would happen if the synchronization were relaxed? Okay, and if you relax the synchronization over there, you used to update the list of points moving, this is the result that you get. Okay, what you get is, here is the original, original time, these bars over here, here is the relaxed, these bars over here. Okay, and the speed up, Goes up to up to nine x. You get nine times speed up with eight processes. Pardon me. You get nine times speed up with eight processes. With eight threads, eight threads. Yeah. That's the speed up of uh, relaxed versus original. Right. Not the speed up to running on a single core. Right. Ah, right. Okay. Right. And uh, this is yeah. This is this is just dividing the squares. You lose some accuracy when you. Okay. Get, get into that next. Ah, okay. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so for, for first let me finish the, the performance improvement part. Okay, for, for different combinations. So here are uh, how many clusters, the number of clusters that you have, 
okay, and, and number of threads. And you find that, that across the board you get, you get pretty good, I mean, there are, there is, I mean, if you examine, you'll find that systematically, you know, that as you get into, into certain regions over here, okay, the speed up becomes one, okay, if you don't get much speed up. And this is a point when you've got large number of threads and large number of clusters, okay. So, but you do see significant speed up in many combinations, but uh, none of the combinations, none of the combinations showed a degradation of performance. So you're not going to be worse than, than before. So then, so then now David's question comes, what about the ac accuracy, okay, the quality of the solution? <coughs> so the, how do you measure the quality? Now in this case, there was no measure of the quality. They just said if once, once it converges, and, and you'll find that the many problems are this way. Uh, they, there is no question about the quality of the solution. They say if you converge, you're done. It's like saying that, that if I've got the hills and valleys, you know, I reach one valley and I'm okay. Okay, and that, uh, many problems are of that type. Okay, and, and so, so what we did was we actually computed the total sum of distances of all the points to the, to the centroids. This was not there in the original problem, but we did an extra, extra calculation, and that is a pretty good indicator of the quality of the solution. Okay, and here is the difference, difference between the, the relax and the original, okay, in terms of percentage of that value. Okay, and it's never more than off by 0.3%. Were your numbers sometimes better than the uh, synchronized in, in other examples we have. Okay, in this particular case, it was. Yes, in, in there, were, there were examples where it was better. And again, you used a linear measure rather than a quadratic No, it was measure. quadratic. It was, it was, it was <laughs> Euclidean distance. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. Okay, uh, in fact, the, the way these problems are formulated, you've got many degrees, many, many features. Okay, and when, when you're trying to trying to figure out uh, the clustering, there are many features that that need to be combined. So but it was an average of Euclidean distance, not the average of the squares of the distances, and then take the square root at the end. No, no, it was it was the square. Take the square root after taking the squares. Yes, some of the squares and then square root. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> Just what I wanted. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's go quickly to to the graph 500 problem. Okay, and this is a breadth-first search of a very large scale-free graph. I mean, for people who want to know what scale-free graphs look like, this is what scale-free graphs look like. Okay, and, and it's representative of, of certain real-life analytics problems. For example, let's say that you wanted to mail a flyer to all people who are connected directly, directly and transitively to a certain set of person or persons. Okay, you just want to send flyers to this thing. So what you do is you start at some point, you do a breadth-first search, and see what are all the people reachable from that person. Okay, and we took an award-winning IBM solution. Okay, which was this. This was the top in the top 500. We took we took that problem, the formulation of the problem over there. Okay, didn't change the code. Okay, all we did was look for the race over there. Okay, and then and done. One minute. Yeah. And, uh, okay, okay, and and the, the initial experiment, uh, you you the nodes on the wavefront require an atomic update. And the atomic update synchronization uh, operation, what would happen if you change that to simply an R? Okay. And here, here, are, the, here are the results that, that we saw. Okay, for one case, I'll show you um, the, uh, uh, the other cases too. Okay, each column represents a different relaxed one. Okay, over here. Okay, and what you find is that the missing vertices that you got, the number of people that you would have missed sending out a flyer to, was 29 out of this number. Okay, that's, that's all you would have missed out on. Moreover, if you, even if you wanted the level numbers, like the, like you know, this adosh, I mean, uh, distance and things of that, or the degree of, I mean, what do you call it? Degree of separation. Okay, that number, okay, there were only so many vertices which had a, a, a round number. Okay? So, so one of the ways, so then the, the next question comes, how can you, how can you ensure the accuracy? Uh, how can you ensure that your problem never, never does worse than 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 before? You might need to wrap up. I okay. think you have. Okay. So 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 I I I'll just just say that it, it is it is useful to to have techniques by which what you want to do is to say that have an internal metric. It's like having a syndrome which checks. Okay, and saying that are you on the right path? If you're not on the right path, okay, then go back to the synchronized version. Okay, and that versioning, okay, is useful, and that's described a lot in the paper. Okay, and we can we can discuss it more during the discussion if you want to. 
There are many applications suitable for relax and check. And, and as I said before, the, the idea is to say, okay, uh, and you're right, this doesn't have to be here, it can be anywhere in that space. Okay, uh, how do you move, move in that direction towards the human brain? Okay. Great. Thanks.